Hello, hello, movie friends. Welcome back to the show. Anthony here. And James here. Today we're going to talk about an iconic, like, cult classic film, Donnie Darko. This came out in 2001, written and directed by Richard Kelly, starring Jake Gyllenhaal, Jenna Malone, Maggie Gyllenhaal. And this movie, it's so damn good. IMDb has an 8.0. Ron Tomatoes, it is an 86%. But I think it's better than both of those scores. And the thing with it is this movie came out 20, 21 years ago, still being talked about, still being analyzed. That's why I think it's so legendary and such a great film. Is um, People are still confused by it. I was confused by this movie for years, like years and years, especially when I was a kid. We saw it in, in, when we were kids and then yeah. when we were teenagers, I saw it a few times. And I still didn't really get it. But um, this episode, we're going to explain everything about Donnie Darko. We're going to tell you what it's about if you're confused by it. But still, what's cool about it is it, it's still ambiguous, which I think is so fun. We uh, we found all the secrets yeah. online. <laughs> <laughs> but this movie, yeah, we were kids when it came out. We didn't see it in theaters, but it was a DVD rental, VHS rental sensation. Every It was huge word of mouth. Like, this is before pr the widespread internet was used. Like, all we had at this time was AOL chat. So when movies beca like this became cult classics, it was because word of mouth. It was because people were like, have you seen Donnie Darko? And stuff like that. And and I'm sure the rentals, I, I, I didn't find the numbers, but I'm sure the rental numbers were huge for this because it wasn't successful at the box office. It only made $7 million. Um, so it barely made its money back, but it was a cult sensation like Fight Club where it was part of the consciousness, especially with young people. I feel like everybody that we knew saw Donnie Darko and loved it. And it was something, it was a movie we would put on with friends like to watch Donnie Darko. And it's one of those like early 2000s, late 90s, indie films coming out of America that really just took the world by, took the country by sensation in terms of pop culture, young adults, teenagers, stuff like that. So like it really exposed, I think, larger audiences to independent film. And I think that's such a tremendous thing to have. Great point. Yeah, it was an early purveyor of indie films. And the movie only happened because of Drew Barrymore. Um, she was, you know, one of the biggest stars at the time. And she was working on Charlie's Angels. And then the script from Richard Kelly got into her hands and um, they met about it, and she loved the script so much that she ended up executive producing the film and co-starring in it. And executive producing means you're putting up a lot of the money for the film. So it only happened because of Drew Barrymore. Otherwise, it would have been a, a a stars movie to just on stars. And like back then, like an HBO movie, a stars movie was not the same as it is now, where like it's still a, a great film. Like those direct to like streaming. Um, not even streaming, but those direct uh, movie channel movies, they were always just like bad movies. Hey, man, they were. <laughs> <laughs> but, but back then it was like it would have been it would have died there. And this is an incredible original idea and screenplay. It's so unique and it's very dense, especially when Richard Kelly came out with the director's cut in 2004 to help explain the movie for people because everyone was still kind of confused about it. A lot of people who weren't like obsessing over it and analyzing it like crazy. He released the director's cut, which had more footage and also had pages from the book, The Philosophy of Time Travel, which is heavily featured in the film. And I love the thematic elements in this movie. I love time travel movies. I love traveling in the future movies. I love the concepts of fate, free will, determinism, which are all over this existential existence, uh, the key to understanding life. And I think d free will and determinism are the biggest themes of this movie. And determinism, uh, free will is obviously the, the will to act and that you have a choice in your life and that fate is not determined. Whereas determinism is the doctrine that all events, including human action, are ultimately determined by causes external to the will. Some philo philosophers have taken determinism to imply that individual human beings have no free will and cannot be held morally responsible for their actions. That's basically the entire concept of the film is whether or not Donnie and the rest of the characters have free will or their fate is determined. It's also uh, has very heavy religious themes in term that tie into those ideas of determinism and predestination um, being a godly force that is controlling everything. And the director's cut it has a lot of deleted scenes in which um, there are more scenes and characters and discussions about um, the idea of God and it's and, and what that would mean in terms of predestination, fatalism, and if you are in control of your own life or on you are you on a path that 
um, God has set forth for you. So that actually, there's plenty of religious elements in the in the theatrical cut, but the director's cut has a lot more of those elements in it. More of the production elements. I love the 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 interesting and unique camera work and editing style of this film. There's a lot of like sideways angles that turn a little bit, and then lots of fast forwarding, some rewinding, a lot of effective use of slow mo combined with long takes that will be either slow mo to open up and then they'll be sped up later. Three hundred uh, style. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it looks really great. It works really. <laughs> Well, it plus, ties into the idea of the yeah. movie. Plus, a lot of the, the the soundtrack is an absolutely incredible. It's so eighties, so good because the movie takes place in nineteen eighty eight. I mean, we have Tears for Fears, Duran Duran, and especially that the final song of the film during the final sequence of Mad World by Gary Jules, fe featuring Michael Andrews, who did the score for the film. Um, and I think that's one of my favorite uses of music in a movie, not by like not film score. I mean, by like songs by artists in a movie, which Michael Andrews did the score, but he partnered up with Gary Jules for that last track. Yeah, there are some songs that become famous because of the movie they're featured in. And that's a song that it became a sensation because of this movie. Like everybody knows a song because they've watched Donnie Darko and it works really well. And there, there isn't that much um, music in the film for popular culture music, but what he what Richard Kelly did select for music worked really well in each scene that he used it in. And some of the lyrics they talk about and some of the songs talk about time and fate and just like obviously just teenage life. And that's I think this movie is just a great genre blend of it's got elements of horror, um, but it's also comedy. It's dramatic. It's very funny. Yeah, it's a coming of age story. It's dark as hell, but also it's it doesn't it walks a fine line of being dark enough where it's not scary but also but it has that interesting horror quality without like being a full-on horror movie yeah and we went to catholic school so we i think i really related to this film with donnie's being in school and having to wear uniforms and you know religious themes are always uh, surrounding you at school so i really gravitated towards that and related to the character and donnie is a really unique character for a, a film about a young person uh, i think that a lot of films that feature either coming of age stories or feature a character who is a teenager. I feel like the characters are rarely very complex. Um, whereas Donnie is such a terrific character. He's dealing with mental illness. So we think, um, and I think that Jake Gyllenhaal's performance, this was his breakout. Like he was in, um, what's the rocket one? This October is, sky, October sky. But this one was like Homer Heckam. Uh, yeah, he was sensation after this. And this proved that he was extremely talented. He's really terrific in this role. And I think that the movie really works because of he plays like this creepiness really well. When it's like a fine line between comedy, like whenever he's talking to Frank, he's got this like really creepy smile. And he actually drools a lot. If you notice in the film, he always has like uh, drool dripping down his, his bottom lip. And I think those are also elements to the character that um, Jake Gyllenhaal brought. Yeah, he kind of plays three different characters in this movie he plays donnie who's at home and in school where he hides himself he's always defensive and angry with people and short uh donnie with frank where he does that different childlike voice in a way and then donnie in therapy where he's incredibly vulnerable and open with his therapist so he kind of takes on three roles in this film yeah he's much more nuanced in the therapy sessions because it's the only place where he can be honest because uh, obviously, when he talks about his mental health problems with his family, they always turn to fights, especially with his sister, and he's not comfortable doing it. But with the therapist, he's much more open, and he seems you know, to be a much more likable person in the therapy sessions as well. And the sleepwalking, it seems as though when he is, is hypnotized, he resorts back to a childlike state. Hence the childlike mannerisms and way of speaking. Now, before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast is to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast, where you get awesome perks like our podcast schedules, personalized videos, Patreon shoutouts on the show for top tier and Godfather tier patrons, as well as bonus episodes. And Godfather tier get their own custom bonus episode that they get to choose. We also just launched our podcast masterclass online course this year. For, so for anyone who wants to start a podcast or improve their current podcast, our 22 chapter 46 video lesson course will give you all the secrets behind the scenes of our show to try to find the success that we have found the link is podcast masterclass.teachable.com or just go on our website raiders of the lost podcast.com it's right there on the home page you can also see all of our sources of content merch custom movie posters thank you for tuning in listening watching wherever you're tuning into the show around the world hit the notification bell subscribe everything thank you so much leave those five star reviews use the coupon codes we can't thank you enough for everything and it, the movie has a terrific supporting cast as well i mean you have patrick swayze 
uh, in then uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal is excellent. Drew Barrymore, obviously, and I love the because uh, the dynamic between Maggie and Jake is honestly like true to life because they are siblings. Siblings seems authentic, so it feels so realistic. The way they argue, the way they cut each other off in sentences, and it it feels like have I've never we never had sisters, but you know I, I'm sure that. Siblings, siblings, are siblings. siblings are always fighting, whether it be boys or girls. You know what I mean. But you still love each other. Yeah. You know, even when you hate each other at the at your highest points, you still love that person. You, you know, your family forever, and you can kind of get that sense. And I'm sure it must have been weird to bring a real relationship of being siblings into a fictional relationship of, of being siblings. But I'm sure they use it to their advantage. I'm sure they terms. had a great time. Yeah, on set, they're maybe, probably cracking up. We they, would be cracking up the whole time. Or, yeah, and probably being blatantly uh, honest with their performances of each other. Like, yeah, oh, maybe you should not do it like that. You suck at acting. Because <laughs> <laughs> like when we we played little league baseball and we were all we were generally on different teams. But there were a couple of situations where, and James was a pitcher, so there are a few situations where I would be at bat and he would be pitching, and we're on different teams, and we were like cracking up every time that happened and smiling. We just couldn't like hold in the laughter sometimes. Peaked at peaked at twelve when yeah. that pitching title. He uh, he pegged me in the arm one time. I think All star game. Purpose. All star game. Yeah. So I couldn't even like, man, I was so mad. My at bat got ruined by a peg. I think. <laughs> Hit by pitch. Anyways. Oh yeah, that's what that's what we call hit by pitch. Um. So do you wanna? I, I was thinking since this movie's so confusing and maybe people listening haven't seen it in a while or maybe they just watched it recently and prepped for the episode. Um. But it's still confusing. It, before we continue, is it cool if I run through like a synopsis of the film? Jim, that's so cool. Just like a two minute that's like super cool. Everything that happens. Obviously, we're spoiling this movie if you haven't seen it. So here's your warning if you haven't seen it. But I got this. I found this great synopsis from. Uh, film comics explained uh, on YouTube, so I'm just gonna run through it real quick, and it'll just—I think it'll set the episode up better, and we'll be—you know—everyone will be more prepared for what we're gonna talk about because it's gonna get deep. We're gonna talk about everything that's happening in this movie, and we're going to explain whether you know Donnie's crazy, it's on his mind, or he really has these supernatural abilities, di- interdimensional abilities. Yeah, and these aren't—it's not just like a random film theory; it's actually in the d- director's cut of the deleted scenes. All right, so. This is the synopsis. We meet Donnie on October 2nd in 1988 in the small town of Middlesex as he wakes up on a road in the woods after sleepwalking. From the start, it becomes apparent that Donnie is troubled and often nowhere to be found. This prompts his family and friends to constantly ask, where do you go at night? Even when he's home, Donnie is unresponsive to his parents, Rose and Eddie, and and disregards their pleas for him to open up. And he's also playfully abrasive and offensive to both his siblings, prompting his older sister, Elizabeth, played by Jake's actual sister, Maggie, to reveal that he'd stopped taking his medication. As his detachment and frustration at not knowing his purpose in life begins to increase, an entity from a tangent universe known as Frank suddenly appears and says, 28 days, 6 hours, 42 minutes, 12 seconds, that is when the world will end. When Donnie wakes up the next morning on his local golf golf course, he returns home to find out that sleepwalking had saved him from a plane's jet engine, which which mysteriously crashed through his bedroom in the middle of the night. Bizarrely, not a single person can determine where the engine came from. And after forcing his family to sign non-disclosure agreements, investigators of the FAA put them up in a hotel and promised to repair their home. Over the next few days, Donnie continues to see Frank and exhibit strange behaviors, prompting prompting his psychiatrist to begin hypnotherapy and wrongfully conclude that he was suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. During this t- during this period, Donnie befriends new girl Gretchen, who's moved to town with her mother to escape her violent stepfather. The pair bond, finding solace in their shared feelings of alienation, and Gretchen becomes one of the primary factors causing him to eventually accept his purpose in life. After being prompted by Frank, Donnie asks his science teacher Kenneth Men. Professor Monotov, if he believed in time travel. Monotov then encouragingly gives him a book called The Philosophy of Time Travel, and it's here that the pieces to the puzzle begin to fall into place. This book is the most important key to understanding Donnie Darko. Written by Roberta Sparrow in 1944, when she taught science at Donnie's school, the literature serves as a Bible for the film's characters and helps to navigate the story. We glimpse pages from The Philosophy of Time Travel, and its contents are discussed by the characters in the film. It's only when we read the excerpts that the concepts within reveal their importance to the film. One of the most important ideas of the book is the two dimensions of the film story, which it refers to as the primary universe and the tangent universe. The primary universe is essentially the universe that Donnie usually lives in, whereas the tangent universe is a copy that forms due to a glitch in the fourth dimension of that time that happened just prior to the jet engine crashing into Donnie's house. We never find out what caused the glitch. 
Later, Frank has convinced him to set fire to the home of a motivational speaker with a dark secret. Donnie holds a Halloween party to celebrate his sister's acceptance into Harvard, seeing more signs that indicated Frank's prophesied end of the world might be real. Donnie and Gretchen head to Roberta's home to unearth more information to see if there is a way to undo everything. Unfortunately, the pair are attacked by bullies moments before. Gretchen is tragically struck by a car as a driver hops out. We realize that he's in fact the universe's version of the Frank that he'd been communicating with him through the film. Using a gun that he found in the house earlier, the distraught Donnie shoots Frank and carries Gretchen's body to his home to find a vortex forming above the house. Then things can go from bad to worse when he sees the plane carrying his mother and sister in the distance gets sucked into the vortex. Moments before one of his engines plummets down from the clouds, the previous 28 days then rewind and Donnie awakens back on the 2nd of October laughing as the engine falls on him. The final shots of the film are taken by those who've been touched by Donnie in the previous timeline, some of whom haven't met him here, including Gretchen who rides her bike past his house and exchanges a troubled glance with his mother and they both, both have a sense of deja vu. So that's kind of a rundown of everything that basically happens in the film. It's very, very intense, very complex, and it can mean a lot of things, but the revealing nature of the director's cut gives us a lot more information in terms of what Richard Kelly, his story is, and also fills in a lot of the ambiguous nature of what exactly is happening. And because in the director's cut, you get we get actual we get to actually see the pages of the philosophy of time, the explanations of what's going on, who Donnie is, who all these other characters are, and how they are playing a part in preventing like a black hole from absorbing all space and time. And this is all pretty well laid out in the director's cut. And James and I are going to do our best to walk you through what all of this means, what it all is. Um, without being too confusing, but it is still pretty confusing. And you can see from the director's cut how much went into this story because I, I do like the original cut because it's more ambiguous and up to the audience to interpret, interpret what's going on. But when you watch the director's cut and deleted scenes, a lot of it makes more sense. And eventually, you know, ultimately the director's cut reveals that um, the idea of Donnie Darko having mental illness and schizophrenia isn't true. Um, I think one of the obviously one of the most revealing scenes is that there's a therapist scene where the therapist tells him that his medication that he's been taking were placebos, um, and so he doesn't have mental illness. And we end up learning that he, everything that he's experiencing and seeing is real and it is really happening, although only he can see it all. But again, it's up to you to determine if you're watching the director's cut or theatrical cut. Even if you watch both, you get to decide. You know, it's your viewing experience. You're the audience member. At the end of the film, you can still say, I think it was all in his mind. You know, I'm not going to fight you on that. But this is basically just what, what we believe in to be true. And, you know, again, the key to understanding Donnie Darko is Roberta Sparrow's book, The Philosophy of Time Travel. And so we're going to go through a little bit of it and go through the terminology. But basically, the concept of the whole film is that there was the second universe the second reality that was duplicated from Donnie's reality by a glitch in time. Think of like a, a multiverse kind of scenario. It's basically, it's an yeah. exact copy of the universe, except Donnie's not supposed to be alive. And that's basically what we're living in because he accidentally escaped death by sleepwalking and not being crushed by that jet engine. But he was meant to be. But he was, yeah, so he was meant to. But he's this universe that he's in, this entire film basically takes place in this tangent universe. Now, a primary universe is what Donnie and what we live in, but then the tangent universe is the universe where the movie takes place after Donnie escapes his supposed fate of being crushed by that plane engine. Because think of it, th oh, sorry, think of the tangent universe as like a universe that wasn't meant to happen. Exactly, but accidentally happened. And so he should have died, but he, instead he was chosen to prevent the end of the world from the tangent universe collapsing into himself. Because even though a, ta a tangent universe is very rare, and created by corruptions in time or glitches in reality. Again, it's like a it's like a copy of the universe or a parallel universe. If it occurs, a tangent universe will be highly unstable, sustaining itself only for no longer than several weeks or you know the entire month of October, basically like, like the film. Eventually, it will collapse into itself, forming a black hole within the primary universe, capable capable of destroying all existence. Now, in in. There is no explanation for what caused this duplicate universe to be created, but that is pointed out as being a possibility of God's existence. Um, like a glitch in the fourth dimension could be uh, a mistake by God 
um, so a higher power causing the, all of this to happen and the evidence of this entire thing happening is the artifact. Now, uh, the artifact in this film is the plane jet engine. Now, according to uh, the philosophy of time, when a tangent universe is created, an artifact will also spontaneously appear. And the artifact is the first sign of evidence that a tangent universe has been created and they are always made of, me made of metal. This ties to the conversation with this teacher about being able to travel through time with a metal um, ship of some kind, anything metal, he says. And so in this case, in this movie, the artifact in this situation is the jet engine. Now, what happened was during this mistake within the fourth dimension, this glitch, this jet engine, it was a copy of the jet, the same exact jet and jet engine from the primary universe, and it was accidentally put in this universe. And so there's actually a deleted scene where... Um, People, there's air traffic control and airport people, their tr personnel, they're trying to f figure out where this plane engine came from. It's not in the theatrical cut, but we learn through these scenes that there is a duplicate engine because if you look at the engine in this movie, there's a spiral on it. And so they dis they discover that there is an identical engine of the ad identical plane and it's totally fine. So this engine comes from the primary universe. Now, it's important to remember that the tangent universe is not created by the jet engine or by Frank waking up Donnie where, and causing him to sleepwalk, missing his death. We're already in the tangent universe when both these events occur. Again, like Anthony said, we don't understand or ever find out what caused the tangent universe to begin with. It's just an unexplained phenomenon. Maybe, uh, like Anthony said, it could be God. So the, remember, this entire film is taking place in the tangent universe. And so the engine and Frank are their after effects of the tangent universe already being formed. And so... The so, art, so the artifact it makes the tangent universe unstable. That's why it's going to collapse on itself into a black hole. We never understand why just this plane engine, even though it's duplicated and it's in this wrong universe, why it's going to end the world. But we can just assume it can't an handle having the uh, anomaly of a duplicate object within it. So in order for the tangent universe to unravel without forming a black hole, it must once again be an exact copy of the primary universe. So we have. So what Donnie has chosen to do, Donnie's chosen to remove one of the duplicate engines to put it back into the primary universe to bring balance out in the universe so that it doesn't collapse into itself to create a black hole which also means that he's going to have to sacrifice himself and be killed by the jet engine and the black hole will be formed within 28 days so it's a reality that the, the when frank tells them the world will end in 28 days it's true because the, the the artifact existing in this tangent universe is becoming unstable and more and more unstable. And so that finale with all those clouds and stuff and all, like the ending that happens, that's right when the world is about to collapse into a black hole and all of reality will be sucked into it. Yeah, so Donnie, he's gifted with these like supernatural abilities. He's, he's gifted with super strength because he's able to bury the axe inside the solid bronze mascot, which they make a mention of when they're looking yeah. at it. It's like that should be humanly impossible. Um, he also obviously has these visions of the liquid spears, which are basically the paths of fate and destiny that everyone has. He sees people's movements and they also lead him to find things like the gun. And he also, in, at the end of the film, he actually uses telekinesis to rip the jet engine off the plane to send it through that time portal, which he also creates using water because water and metal are main objects used for time travel. And it's also important to remember that Although Donnie, you know, I think people think that he's at the end of the film, he's traveling back in time. He's not traveling back in time. So because he sent the artifact out of the tangent universe and sent it back into the primary universe, the primary universe basically just kind of resets where it was stopped, which is at the point where he escapes his death. So that's why he wakes up to in his bed laughing knowing that the jet engine's about to fall on top of him because he didn't travel back in time. You could say that he at this point maybe would have dreamed or had an entire vision of everything that just happened throughout the course of the film in the tangent universe so now he knows everything that's happened that's why he's laughing he didn't, he didn't go back in time maybe maybe his soul did in a way or the ghost of his soul in a way but he basically the universe the primary universe just resets because now it's in balance you in a th way to think about it is, is that never happens after the at the end of the film those 28 days never happened yes. so he didn't travel back in time they just ceased to exist so the tangent universe collapsed onto itself 
without ever existing with no repercussions to the primary universe, even though the plane that he took it from was the plane that his mother and sister were on. That's where he got the jet engine from in the tangent universe to send to the primary universe. Since that universe no longer exists, they didn't die or anything. Nothing happened to them. And and Donnie's part to play is has a name, and he's called the Living Receiver. And so when a tangent universe is created in the artifact, with the artifact, a living receiver is chosen. And now this person is chosen at random. And in this case, Donnie was chosen because he was located right where the glitch happened and was would have been crushed by the artifact. And so that's why he was chosen because he was the, the he's the only person who can actually stop it from happening. And this person, like you said, James said, is blessed with like supernatural powers. And I like how Richard Kelly doesn't like show him breaking the engine off. Like we just, we have to believe it's happening. And Donnie isn't aware of his responsibilities at first. He doesn't even know he's in a tangent universe at first, but um, through his interactions and the way the story plays out, he begins to understand he has a part to play in all of this. And that's why he wakes up laughing at the end because he's like, I did it. I, I, I saved the world and I'm a hero, although no one will know that, but that's why. And the entire film is basically Donnie being used as a chess piece by this higher power, this higher entity, using the manipulated dead, the manipulated living, which are in terms we'll get to in a second, to put him in this course of events of, you could say, fate and determinism to get him to understand what's happening, you know, with getting the philosophy of time travel from his professor and then exploring that idea, the visions of Frank, which is Frank is the ghost uh, from the Tangent Universe, which was killed by Donnie with the gun, who was sent back in time to communicate with Donnie to warn him and give him the signs of everything. And so Donnie, throughout the film, has to is being taught and he has to understand what's happening to him and what's happening to the world. So the whole film is Donnie coming to terms and understanding what's happening to him, what's happening to the world, and then also accepting his fate that he not only has to kind of do this mission to save the world, but he also has to die and sacrifice himself. Yeah, and, and a, a really simple way to look at this is that the universe, the tangent universe that the film takes place in, a great way to think about it is that it's a copy. Like this whole universe is a copy, copied from the primary universe, the real universe. And so every character is a duplicate copy of themselves from that other universe. And that's why Frank, when he, when the character Frank is in this universe, it's his ghost because Donnie killed him in that universe. So him being the manipulated dead happened because he was killed in the primary universe. Hence he returns, he comes to this copy as like a ghost, even though the the embodiment, the other copy of him is himself. Like in, when he hits um, Jenna Malone's character with the car, that version of Frank, that's like the pre-interaction with Donnie version of Frank that was copied. And the ghost Frank is the post-death version of Frank copied into this into this universe. And Frank's an example of a manipulated dead. There are two manipulated dead characters. It's Frank and then Gretchen. So manipulated dead are anyone connected to the living receiver who dies in the tangent universe. They become manipul manipulated dead. These people are very powerful, have the ability to move through time and talk to the living receiver through a fourth dimensional construct. So that's what Frank's doing. He's communicating with Donnie through time travel because he was killed in the, turn in the tangent universe by Donnie. He's connected to Donnie in that way. Gretchen also is like that as well. And then we have the manipulated living where these are all the people connected to the living receiver are oh, sorry these are the people connected to the living receiver and these people will subconsciously help guide the living receiver on their path so all the characters in this world in this universe every little thing that happens to donnie is an example of him basically not having control of his fate or or having free will he has the illusion of free will but all these characters the things they do with him they put him in place and set him on this path to, that he's supposed to fulfill to eventually come to terms with everything and accept his fate and save the universe, basically. So everything from the professor giving him the philosophy of time travel, him and Roberta, him and Grandma Death's interactions, him and, him, him and Gretchen, you know, if he doesn't flood the school because of Frank telling him to, he doesn't have that conversation with Gretchen. He doesn't have, he doesn't become Gretchen's boyfriend and everything that happens with them later on in the film to, in her death causing him to want to save the universe. And, well, but first of all, her death causes him to kill Frank, which creates the living, um, the manipulated dead Frank 
the ghost which will guide Donnie on his journey. Exactly, but also what I'm saying is Gretchen's death is probably the final bit of fate that causes Donnie to say that I want to save everyone. You know, because yeah. she says that line where um, uh, she doesn't want to kiss him yet because she wants to be reminded how beautiful the world can be. And also they with their project, their like science project, they want to try to replace all the pain and darkness in the world with something beautiful. And this is his way of doing that. He probably would have never gotten that idea if he never met Gretchen, if he never became his, her, her boyfriend. And if she never died, he would have never wanted to sacrifice himself to save her. And also the manipulated dead, um, I mean the living, wait, which ones are these? Living... The manipulate living. Man manipulate living. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's complex. We, we Again, this. thank you to uh, the director's right. cut and, yeah. uh, and, and Richard Kelly for yeah. all this information. JohnnyDarker.org. Yeah. yeah. Evidence of this world actually, of this all being real, is in the epilogue. So after Donnie's death, um, there's that montage with Mad World playing, and Richard Kelly shows images of all of the supporting characters um, that morning before the plane engine hits his house. And every single one of the characters from you have Patrick Swayze's character weeping um, about um, who he really is. You have Frank, the guy um, you see he's designing. He has been designing his Frank bunny costume, but also he uh, gestures on his eye. And then you have uh, an example of uh, Jenna Malone's character waving at Donnie's mom. Uh, and these are all signs of, you know, deja vu of the subconsciousness of the characters. Um they, they experienced that tangent universe, but it's gone now. But to them, it was like it was a dream. Like Frank, it, to him, it's like he had a dream where maybe his eye was shot. But it happened in the, a different universe, but he still has like the remnants of all of that in his mind. So uh, Richard Kelly is showing you that all of that really happened by the interactions of these characters in the epilogue. Now, the philosophy of time travel. Paul, do you want to get into our intermission first? I just got one more thing to okay. say. How about we finish up the terminology, then we'll go intermission, then we'll Sounds talk great. about the film in general. So, Sounds great. A couple of final basic points. The philosophy of time travel states that the that all the manipulated are trying to lure the living receiver into a trap so, so that he has no choice but to send the artifact out of the tangent universe into the primary universe. So again, the, manip the manipulated characters, the living and dead, are all working to get Donnie to send that artifact back into through time into the primary universe 28 days previous so that he has to kill himself to save the entire universe so every character in the film manipulated li manipulated living manipulating dead again they're all working subconsciously to get donnie on this path into the right direction so all these things happen to him which the entire concept of the, all of their fates are determined and they none of them have free will which is really interesting Whew. Pretty crazy. And then obviously the end of the film that Vortex appears over Donnie's house. That's when he sends the jet engine through time to through the changing universe back to the primary universe. Again, wakes up, accepts his death, gets killed, and then the world just is set to balance and everything's okay. And no and no one experiences all that pain and death. It's like a reset, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's basically the complicated stuff about the film. And so let's head into our intermission. We'll give you a brain break, and then we'll break down some more of the movie. And if you still have questions, obviously, just DM us on Instagram or Twitter or yeah. whatever, and we'll, we'll try we to have, We explain. got a bunch, so we can answer those as well. But yeah, I think that's a pretty good explanation of what's I happening. I think we did a good job so right, far. Intermission yeah. time. Let's do it. Let's begin with our movie quotes competition. This is from Josh, our fan. Don't believe sermons, fairy tales, or stories about money, baby sister. But thanks for the cigarette. Hmm. I don't know. Some Western. True Grit. Ah, nice. Good one. Thanks, man. Okay, here's my quote. Kid, there's something I ought to tell you. I never shot anybody before. One hell of a time to tell me. Hmm. Hmm. That's a good one. I think we're going to go 0 for 2 to open up the intermission. I don't know. <laughs> Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. Ah. Yeah, Butch has never shot anyone yeah. before. All right, guess this movie release year. Crazy Heart. Good one. 2011. 2009. Damn it. Scott Damn it. That movie got two Oscars for Jeff Jack Bridges. Jeff Bridges won. And what up? Best song. Best song? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Guess this movie release year. The Hustler. 19. 
87. No, 1961. 61. Oh, I, I don't know why I was thinking of the color, color of money. money. <laughs> I was like, man, he must be thinking of the other one. <laughs> what yeah, an Hustlers idiot. And, Hustlers an old movie. Yeah, no. Paul Newman's really young in it. Yeah, no, I was just, I was like, how I was like, how old was Tom Cruise in The Hustler? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, mm. <laughs> my brain just didn't work right there. I think the the Donnie Darko discussion just fogged me up. Sure it did. It's a great <laughs> excuse. Nothing but excuses from you. <laughs> All right, uh, movie pop quiz time. You already said my. All right, so what was Jake Gyllenhaal's first lead role? Oh, it was um, October Sky. Yeah. Yes. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh, that was determinism right there, where I would say the question that Anthony would eventually say earlier in the episode. I'm the living dead. <laughs> living, living manip- the manipulated dead. No, I'm the. No, I'm the um, manipulated living. No, I'm the uh, the You're chosen one. What's it called? The re- living living receiver. Receiver. <laughs> receiver of what? <laughs> we'll see. I can't tell you. All right, kid. I can't trust you. Just give me your pop quiz. How many Oscar nominations did Paul Newman receive? Paulie Nooms. How many did he receive? I'm going to guess. And if you uh, want to go for bonus points, what did he win for? I'm going to guess five. Wrong. Six. Wrong. Two. Ten. Ten. (laughs) Ten. Jesus. Ten nominations. What did he win for? Hmm. Great actor. Underrated. I don't know. What did he win for? For the color of money? Color of money. Man. Man, I'm just 0 for 3 today, I think, right? You got to brush up on your Paul Newman, man. (laughs) (laughs) I think the color of money is one of the best sequels ever made. Probably. All right. Um, what do we have for haters this week? Any? Any? Or we didn't have any haters at all. Any unsubscribes? No. Un- um, not that I could see. All right. Well, I have a, a great supporter of the week. I have two. So I have uh, Ian Hiat has been commenting constantly every day for a couple weeks now to get a shout out on the podcast. So here's your shout out, Ian. Hope you tuned in. And then also, this is a five star review from Chase Buster, Eagles fan here. Hey, what the F? I'm an Eagles fan here. Don't ever say fly. Eagles fly out of the playoffs. <laughs> unsubscribe. <laughs> oh, I actually do have a unsubscribe one. Uh, it was You posted a clip about the uh, in The Shining how Jack's reading a Playgirl. Mm-hmm. And then Blair Woodcourt wrote, You mean you don't read pornographic magazines while waiting for a job interview? <laughs> Unsubscribed, XXX. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on this day in film history, today is February 24th. In 2017, Get Out was released, and happy birthday to Billy Zane and Daniel Kaluuya. He dominates February 24th. Oh, wow, nice. Pretty cool. Not much else happened. Listen to your friend Billy Zane. He's a cool dude. He's a cool dude. (laughs) Wow. All right, my streaming recommendation is The Rock on Amazon Prime. This is a great action movie. It's basically a James Bond movie in a way, and I think it's the only Michael Bay movie that is fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Pain and Game was pretty good. Um, my streaming recommendation is Pain and Glory by Pedro Almodovar, starring um, Antonio Banderas. It's a really terrific film. It came out uh, a few years ago. Uh, Antonio was nominated for Best Actor I'm um, at the Oscars, and he's really sensational in the film. I love it. I adore it. Penelope Cruz co-stars. It's available to rent, not for free, but I definitely recommend checking it out. And for today's Godfather patron shout-out, we have our good friend and fan of the show, Adam Beardsley. He has joined our Godfather Patreon tier, and we couldn't be more happy to have him on board. We appreciate your support so much, Adam, and we love that you're enjoying the show. Thank you so much, pal. Do you love movie posters? Well, there's no better place to get your posters than at movieposters.com. Use our special Raiders coupon code, Raiders10, to get 10% off your order today. Movieposters.com has all sorts of sizes, framing, backlighting, whatever your poster needs are. They got it covered, as well as a gigantic selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable including a lot of the new releases coming out these days so keep an eye out for all sorts of marvel posters they they have some great spider-man posters as well as batman posters as well great great stuff if you're looking at our set online it is covered in these amazing posters these are high quality the best you can pay for and they're still super affordable again 
head on over to movieposters.com and use our special promo code. Now back to the film. Uh, in regards to this entire tangent universe, glitch in the fourth dimension, all this crazy stuff happening, it's not the first time it's happened in uh, the existence of humanity. Um, it's happened before. Um, it's even ther theorized that Grandma Death, Roberta Sparrow, she was also a living receiver just like Donnie, but unlike Donnie, she survived, which is very rare for a living receiver. They're meant to die generally because Donnie, he's meant to die in order to save the world. Um, and also past living receivers, there is evidence of them. So there are a couple of ancient myths about living receivers. Um, there's a, a Mayan warrior who was killed by an arrowhead that fell off a cliff but there was no army or enemy to be found, which caused the arrowhead to fall off the cliff. And so this is like the airplane jet engine falling on Don Donnie for that Mayan warrior. That Mayan warrior saved the world, uh, came back to the primary universe and was killed just like Donnie in the jet engine. The same thing of a story of a mid medieval knight who was mysteriously impaled by a sword that he had not yet built. And so this is another example of a metal object uh, killing the living receiver after they, um, you can get, you can assume, save the world and fix the glitch from ever expanding into a black hole. That's really interesting stuff. And so it's something that's meant to happen, but Roberta Sparrow is a living receiver who somehow uh, survived her experience. Yeah, and it's interesting because she goes from being a living receiver to a manipulated living because. The fact that Roberta is constantly looking at her mailbox, constantly looking for a letter, and then Donnie writes a letter, which is part of his fate because that causes Frank, when he's driving his car, to swerve out of the road to run over and accidentally run over Gretchen. And if Donnie never wrote that letter, Roberta Sparrow, Grandma Death, never would have been standing in the middle of the road reading that letter, which is really interesting because she went from living receiver to manipulated living. Really, really high concept stuff right there. Yeah, it's pretty wild. It's pretty and wild. You can you can actually see. Um, so this film premiered at Sundance, and it was uh, a, a big hit at Sundance. But it still didn't. It was still struggling to get distribution. And stars, like I said, wanted to buy it to sh to just put on their stars um, subscription platform. And uh, actually, Christopher Nolan was instrumental in convincing a studio to theatrically release it because. He was um he was coming off Memento, so he had a lot of um uh, uh, traction behind him, and he talked the studio execs into being like, "You gotta release this theatrically. Uh, it would be a better experience." Because you can see why he loves the movie so much because of how how intense the themes of you know time and paradoxes are. Because the direct the, the director's cut is what's screened at Sundance, not the theatrical cut. So the cut is two hours and forty minutes of. All this stuff being explained to the audience, that's what everyone saw at Sundance, and that's what the studio bought. But then for the theatrical release, the studio made Richard Kelly cut the movie down to two hours to make it, up, like we've said before, uh, fit more screens and get more viewings for people. Yeah, I'm sure Chris Nolan was at Sundance and saw this movie. He's just like, oh my god, this is amazing. I love every <laughs> everything about this movie. Time travel, different dimensions. Paradox? Oh my god. Oh, this is, oh, you, know, you gotta release this in theater theaters. Let's go, let's go. Um, Again, I love the concept of free will in this movie. Does any of do any of these characters have a choice? You know, like I said, Donnie was moved around like a chess piece. He has no control over his destiny. He simply has to accept that it's happening, which he does at the end of the film. Are we all like Donnie? Is every moment of our life predetermined? Every person we have met, every interaction we've ever had, is it all part of a giant puzzle of time and destiny where it's all affected? This is why I love that show Dark so much because it deals with a lot of concepts like this. And, you know. Was Donnie chosen by this higher power? It seems like he was to be this chess piece to sacrifice himself in this Jesus-like like figure to save the world, to save the universe. And there, this is this concept has been tackled uh, a few times. Most recently in Westworld, um, this idea of uh, a force that knows and knows predestination and fate. Um, what happens is a, a character creates a computer that um, can. Tell tell a person what their life is going to be like for the, when they'll die, um, what they'll be like for like the next 30, 40 years, or however long they live, and and it and, um it basically sh shows the predetermination of each individual. I didn't like that in the in the TV series because it seems like an impossible thing for any kind of computer to do, no matter how big the computer is, the information and 
uh, just the the number of calculations needed to determine the the fate of every individual every interaction being predetermined it seems impossible but it works in this movie because it, it's it's explained as this could be a godlike force something that we don't understand so a computer we understand so i didn't accept that in westworld but uh, a god we wouldn't understand uh, even a, di a different dimensional being is what you could say a, a god is it would be like a fourth dimension fifth dimensional being and that's something that human beings are incapable of even grasping the concept of so for me if you explain it that way a god a godlike force that's creating and controlling everything then i find it easier to accept because we can't even grasp that and there's so many interesting characters in this movie i mean donnie darko like we've been talking about super interesting teenage character because it's also a coming of age film at the same time it does a great job walking so many genres donnie's got a morbid sense of humor which we learn right away he's highly intelligent you know his his Principal says, your Iowa test scores are intimidating. intimidating. And some other great examples of Donnie's intellect without telling us are like the Smurfs explanation with his <laughs> friends, which is super funny. Uh, his, high, his high vocabulary compared to his peers. Uh, the, when he obviously has answers to complex questions like the antiseptics for Gretchen's test uh, for a project. And then teachers grading his papers. Like they're just like Donnie, Donnie Darko. Darko. Like I know, right? It's crazy. And like, what kind of name is that? Donnie Darko. It sounds like a superhero because he is a superhero in this movie. Donnie Darko is a superhero. Yeah. And you know, the superheroes generally have the same uh, first letter in both their first name and surname. Uh, it's it's kind of like a mark of a superhero. Yeah. I really like Drew Barrymore in this film too. She plays Karen Pomeray, the English teacher. And so she is a great example of a manipulated living because when Gretchen first arrives at class, Karen has her do that thing where um, she asks where to sit. She's like, pick ne sit next to the boy who you think is the cutest. And so this is her being manipulated living, guiding Gretchen to sit next to Donnie, which then Gretchen will be part of Donnie's life. So this is an, an example of a manipulated living person character in this tangent universe guiding Donnie on his path. I thought she just wanted to start drama. <laughs> <laughs> it is pretty. No, it, I wonder it, if teachers did do that in the past. I don't know. That's pretty crazy. You'd probably get fired for that. Also, um, Cellar Door is the same exact thing um, because she writes Cellar Door when she's fired. And Donnie asks her what it is. And she says that a linguist said it was the most beautiful word in the English language, and actually, it was um, J.R.R. Tolkien who said that. And the cellar door is significant in the same way that having Gretchen sit next to the cutest boy she thinks is in the class being Donnie, because the cellar door is what motivates Donnie when he goes to Grandma's death house to go into the basement, to go into her house, because right before they enter and his friends are like, let's just go, man, let's just get out of here. He's like, cellar door. And then that, I think, is the last step of motivation for him to get into that house, which makes him in, um, encounter the bullies who bring them out into the, to the road to um, antagonize them. And that ends up forcing Frank driving the car to swerve out of the way of Grandma Death. And that's why Gretchen is on the floor because of – on the ground because of the bullies t bringing them out there and throw her, throwing her on the ground. So the cellar door was another – piece to the puzzle of leading all the characters on this journey and i like how richard kelly this movie's all about time travel and everything in interdimensions but he also throws in and spruces up the story with real conflicts of culture you know where karen is talking to the principal who's firing her that we're losing them to apathy this prescribed nonsense in this world how it's just it's lost it's losing meaning in a way and we, we, and she gets fired because of the book that she has, the short story that she has the kids read that's ironic, but it's where Donnie gets the idea to flood the school is it happens inside of the book she's been she's given them. So she's trying to – she thinks she's being she, – she wants to be a good teacher and make the children think and grow and evolve. But eventually what happens is basically kind of like a, a, a book, book banning by the other students, the other parents at the PTA. Yeah, exactly. And uh, a funny element to this film because the comedy is great, but you know that uh, that guy wearing the the red track suit yeah. who keeps spying on them? He, it's actually revealed that he is a, uh, an agent of the FAA keeping an eye on the Darko family. <laughs> so he's a government official who's spying on them. That's why he's always around. This movie's it's actually really, really yeah. damn funny. Like uh, Sparkle Motion, that whole entire concept, plus um, Kitty, she's a great character because – if you if you've ever been to like a Catholic school, there's always like kind of like a teacher like that who's just like so pure and innocent, or they think they are, and they just want everything to, everything to be perfect. And 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 she's obsessed with 
Jim Cunningham, who is that life coach who spouts that BS and is basically a snake oil salesman for fear and not being a prisoner of your fear. And she shows those those ridiculous tapes to everyone in class. Very and funny. But she's she's a really interesting character. And I think her interaction specifically with, with Donnie, where he tells her to shove the card up her ass. And then her interactions with his mother are really fun as well, too. Yeah. And the Jim Cunningham character is great because I, I never... If I see someone who's like a, a guru and I can make you happier and I know all the secrets to bring joy into your life, I'm always like I always second guess those people. I'm like, I don't I don't trust those people. And Jim Cunningham is an example of an ironic character who spouts all the self help. He's a guru and he can eliminate fear from your life, but he ends up becoming, we find out, like a horrible human being. Yeah, I feel like I've always found that even in our personal lives, we, we yeah. know someone recently who like the people who spelt the most like Oh, I'm, I'm like all advice. about advice and, and ultra positive. It's great to be positive, but like people who are spewing it the most are often the most people who lack it. They lack themselves. it the most. And it's really ironic. And Jim Cunningham yeah. is a perfect example of that because he's got that kitty porno dungeon that's discovered after Donnie burns his house down because Frank tells him like, now you know where he lives. And he, <laughs> he thinks he's the Antichrist. So that was an example of the manipulated death um, moving Donnie on his path to help understand what's happening and I'm sure him discovering that Jim Cunningham was full of a fraud, was a BS and a fraud, helped more motivate him further down his path of fate. Now, but what's really interesting about Jim Cunningham's character is so after Donnie saves the universe, saves the primary universe, sends the jet engine back, this means that no one would have ever discovered that Jim Cunningham porn dungeon in the kitty porn ring that he was involved with which is horrible but maybe you could say that because at the end sequence where everyone's having who is involved with donnie in the tangent universe has that vision or those dreams of everything that kind of happened to them maybe that's a wake-up call for jim cunningham and a way to stop what he's doing to stop these horrific crimes in a way so maybe there's some sort of uh, resolution for these characters in a way and maybe maybe that's what happens to these characters now that donnie's gone and the universe has been balanced i don't think so because someone like that criminals like that like they know it's wrong what they're doing but they keep doing it but also there's a deleted scene um from the director's cut where jim cunningham shoots himself uh, on the golf course okay so yeah so so the uh, the world is balanced then. yeah so yeah. that's so that all right so i didn't see the director's cut like you so that was probably it's best that either way he was yeah. gonna get what he deserved yeah so i don't see i don't see it as like uh uh, the deja vu being things that would change people, but it's like a ghost of the other reality they experienced. Well, it changed him. Yeah. You know, you could say that the deja vu led him to the path where I'm, I don't want to live with myself anymore. Oh, yeah, that's what, that's what I mean. So, oh, yeah, because point. I don't think that I don't think Richard Kelly would want the movie to end where, oh, he gets off scot free, no one's yeah. ever going to find him. I think that's the whole point of that final montage with the Mad World song playing with all the characters who were affected by Donnie in the Tangent Universe. They're replaying basically the feeling of everything that happened in the Tangent Universe, which they didn't actually experience. So I think that that causes Jimmy Cunningham, probably, like you said, now I found out that he kills himself in yeah. the film. That makes sense. Yeah. He, could, he probably thought of it as like a dream where he was discovered and his life was like, destroyed. Like, I can't do this anymore. And I can't yeah. live with myself. And uh, Patrick Swayze is not in a lot of this movie, but he, it's a actually really great nuanced performance, especially that moment where he's like, I can't, I don't want to live with myself anymore. That's what I get when he's crying himself to, in, in, in the middle of the night. Yeah, he, he was always a really terrific actor, and he actually used his own wardrobe for the character of Jim Cunningham because this <laughs> was made very low budget. But I think that Drew Barrymore as a producer is what allowed someone like Swayze to sign on to the film in such a small role. Yeah, for sure. She but, had a lot of sway back then. But like he gets a, like, that's a, a person. It's a juicy role too. It's a juicy role yeah. and also it's a person to get people to see the film. Like, oh, Patrick Swayze's in this and this was 2001. He was, you know, still one of the biggest stars alive at the time. Yeah, this is like pretty close to after Ghost, which was a huge, huge hit. Yeah, yeah. Ghost so, is one of the most profitable film, profitable profitable films ever plus 80s and 90s swayze yeah. was the man oh yeah absolutely. rest in peace it's too bad so i yeah that, that gives me solace to know that yeah. that's what happened to the character and another element to this film that you see a lot is um water and metal and metal is explained by the teacher as you know being uh a, a, an element that can be used through tra time travel and then water is a way of creating uh time portals and that's why you know those little portals coming out from people's chest they look like it's just like t tunnels of water and that's why Donnie's able to create that portal at the end of the film in the sky and the atmosphere because, you know, clouds are moisture. 
So that's ju that's just a portal of water over his house that he sends the jet engine through. So water and metal are elements that are very present in the film. Donnie and Frank's interactions are some of my favorite moments of this film because we don't get a ton of them. There are like, what, five or six times where he's talking to Frank and seeing Frank, maybe, maybe a few more. And Richard Kelly does a great job just giving bits and pieces of it, not too much. I love the voice that Frank has, how it's it's altered because of the mask. Then when he takes his mask off in the movie theater, we see that he's just a young man, you know, with the bull hole in his eye. And I, I love how Donnie's like, why are you always wearing that stupid bunny suit? And he's like, why are you always wearing that stupid man suit? And Frank is terrifying, but also intriguing at the same time. Like, like I said, the film does a great job walking that line where it's not too scary to be in the horror realm, but it's like just enough freakiness to be weird as hell. And like Frank's costume, I think, is that. It's not, it's creepy as hell, but it's not like, horrifyingly scary like i'm not scared of it yeah and one of my favorite moments is in the film i didn't i didn't notice it before but um later in the film when jill and hall the jill and hall siblings are talking to each other in the kitchen there's a, a pumpkin um and a, uh, frank's face has been carved into the pumpkin the bunny face um and i thought that was like i thought it was like an easter egg that richard kelly always put in but it, there, it's a deleted scene where the siblings are cutting pumpkins and carving pumpkins, and he's carving uh, Frank's face into the pumpkin. It's like how he drew the picture of Frank on his calendar. Yeah, and that's why um, the Frank's Frank's handwriting you see on the fridge at the, during the party because the real Frank wrote that I'm going to get beer, and it's that weird font um, of his handwriting mm -hmm. that Donnie spray painted onto the concrete outside the school, and that's why that the font is the same because it's not. Frank that was spray painting the, the ground. It was Donnie influenced by Frank, hence why the font is that same exact creepy font as Frank's handwriting on the fridge door in the party. And I think it's really great when we find out that Frank is like a real person. Like at the party, they're like, hey, where'd Frank go? We're like, oh, we think he went, he went to go get new some beer and his he wrote the note on the fridge and Donnie sees it. So then we find out that he is a real person. He does exist in this tangent universe before Donnie kills him. Yeah, and it's teased because Maggie's like, has anyone seen Frank? And, and you're like, wait, there's a Frank who, and then you're just like excited to finally see the reveal of him. And it, the movie is that, that great twist when it's revealed that Frank is a real person when he after he hits Gretchen with the car. It's so mind bending, and th I think the reason why this movie is so loved and why it was such a cult sensation is because you'd never seen anything like it before. It was so shocking and unexpected what happened in the third act of this film. You could say it's like one of the best third acts ever, and you know that the finale with Donnie saving the world, and then that and then that montage after Donnie's death is just really fantastic and some um, just amazing storytelling and another deleted moment it's not a deleted scene but so at the end of the film when the uh when the engine crashes on Don on Donnie's bedroom we don't see Donnie's death we just see his body being wheeled out on the gurney and the family weeping but in the director's cut um there's a shot of Donnie's death and the the plane engine has crashed through his his, his bedroom it didn't land on him um, it broke, um, obviously, like the ceiling and walls and all. there's wood and debris everywhere. And then a, he was impaled by this huge beam of wood just through his chest. And at the end, it it's shows him just like he's on his bed and he's just been impaled by this wooden beam and it's his like last breaths. And I think that it wouldn't have worked to keep that in a theatrical cut. It's a little too grim. Um, and also, it, it's, it's kind of looked a little cheesy, so... I'm glad they left that out of the theatrical cut, but they actually did really show his death. I really like how I haven't seen the director's cut, but you have, so we get to learn all this information because it's backstory. But I also like the theatrical, I think I, I like the theatrical version. I would like it better. I'm sure you like the theatrical version better where we don't see stuff like that because we don't have to, you know, just enough. There's the, He does a great job with exposition, like little things, These these really short scenes of like, questions for the audience that he answers in like a line of dialogue like Maggie Gyllenhaal's character does it a lot like for example when they're in the hotel and the little sister asks like what happened to the, but where's the plane and she's like they don't know what happened to the plane like little things like that it's just all we need for exposition we don't need to be told every single little thing yeah and that's why I think that the theatrical cut works better because it also leaves a lot up for interpretation about what's going on, whereas the, the, the director's cut uh, does a lot of explaining and kind of kind of holds the audience hand, audience's hand along the way 
to understand everything that's happening. Whereas, so the, the director's cut shows that it's all real and why it's all real and what exactly is happening where the theatrical cut is like, wait, is this all in Donnie's head or is it all really happening? And what the hell is happening is your reactions to the theatrical cut. And that's why I like the theatrical one better. Yeah, could he have paranoid schizophrenia? Is he having these, are these really just delusions and daylight hallucinations? Because you could argue that Elizabeth, his sister, played by Maggie, probably very similar to Donnie except she doesn't she's not played with the mental disturbances whereas you could probably say that donnie if he didn't have these mental disturbances would be just like elizabeth they're both very bright she gets into harvard so they're probably both very similar it minus the the mental illness yeah and it's he's always struggled with that because he's been obviously going to a therapist and taking medication for you could assume over a year or so so uh it, it's it, it seems to be like him being chosen worked out perfectly for who he was as a human being and what he was already dealing with. Do we have um, fan questions we can answer? Actually, yeah. So I, I asked Instagram, um, and Instagram's like, yo, I got some questions for you. <laughs> so these are these are some questions from fans that were pro probably a little confused by it because obviously this is a confusing film. So let me pull up what some of our fans were are confused about with this film and see if there are any questions that we didn't answer in the episode. So let's take a peek what everyone had. So what were the clues through the movie that was that explained what was actually happening? I feel like we covered all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you do an episode of Donnie Darko? It's happening right now, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Is Frank trying to get him to travel back in time the whole movie? So again, don't think of it as Donnie traveling back in time. He's in a different universe, a tangent universe. He's sending the jet engine back in time. He's not traveling back in time. So the jet engine traveling back in time resets the primary universe, and that's where he wakes up basically in his bed where his primary universe had stopped. Yeah, Frank's just trying to get him to save the universe. First, can you remember the first time you watched it? Definitely when we were like 11 or 12 years Kids, old. Yeah. One of our older brothers, probably yeah. Jamie, showed us Confused this movie. Confused the hell out of us, and I was terrified of the, of the bunny. Jamie always showed us cool movies. Um, was it all real, or did Donnie just imagine everything right before he died? Again, Cammy, it's up to you. You know, you get to determine what's right. I'm not going to tell you how to feel or think about a movie. We're just going to give you our opinions. So if you think he... So it's up to you. It's a little ambiguous, I think, even with this explanation. Could it all, have all been inside of his head still? Yeah, for sure. So, Cammy, whatever you believe, I think it's real. Go with it. I think it's all real. Um, why does Donnie think he knows so much about Smurfs? <laughs> <laughs> so that's just a, a really funny scene to show the different level of intellect Donnie has compared to his friends and his peers. He's just thinking on a different level. He just knows probably Smurfs by heart from watching it once and understood everything about it. Um, explain the tangent universe with the dead engine. Think we, I think we got oh, yeah, that we covered done. that for 30 minutes. Not a question, but th it is the best film ever made from Amelia. <laughs> Glad you like it so much. I hope you like our episode. I love this movie so much. Let's see what else we got. Does this hold up against some of Jake's recent performances? I think it's one of his top five maybe in yeah. his career. But again, he's made so many great movies recently, like Prisoners. He's so good in Nightcrawler. So I maybe Southpaw is Southpaw, great. so maybe top five, top ten for sure in his career. I would say I would say he's had so too many great roles in uh, as an older actor to keep this in the top five, but he's great in it. All right, uh, Enigma. Oh man, the Riddler's asking a question. Edward. What does it all mean? What does the ending mean? Does he have powers? Help? I think we answered yeah. all of that. So yeah. yes, 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 he does have powers, and yeah. So just yeah, you tuned in. <laughs> um, and final one. Uh, from Donnie. Why did Gretchen fall asleep within the first five minutes of Evil Dead? <laughs> <laughs> Great point. Like, that movie just started. They didn't even get to the cabin yet and she's falling asleep. Well, it is, like, a little slow in the first 20 minutes. Yeah. Well, it was, but it's loud and, like, exciting. Yeah, but like, I mean... Like, they're driving on that road some people swerving just, out of the road. Some it's, people, like, it's like, Arr! and they're screaming in the car. Some people are movie people and they, they pass out. She's a manipulated yeah. living. No, she's a manipulated dead. So remember, yeah. her character is supposed to fall asleep so that Donnie has the vision of Frank at that moment. And then in burns the screen, down, then cutting, burns him down cutting him out. Yeah. So it's meant to happen. It's supposed to happen because remember, it's all determined in all determinism in this film. All some, the characters. Some people like a movie turns on, they go to sleep. We know we know people like I that. Know, I know plenty yeah, of people. I know, yeah. <laughs> she's just one of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's questions from everybody. So how about some trivia now? I have some trivia. Yeah, I would love to hear it. So Seth Rogen, this is his first movie, and at the rap party for the film, Rogen and Hall both agreed they had no idea what the movie was about. I'd probably be confused too. <laughs> Let's see what else we got. Writer and director Richard Kelly came up with the idea for the future blobs, those little things coming out of people's chests. 
while watching football, John Madden used the Telestrator where he'd diagram a paused video of the football game to show where players were about to move moments before letting the tape roll. Kelly watched this while he was high and started to think about what would happen hypothetically if someone upstairs was actually doing that to humans. Fittingly enough, Donnie first notices the future blobs while watching football. And that, that drawing on the screen, that was Madden's idea. Um, he, he didn't invent it, but he was like, can someone create this so I can use it for while I commentate on games? In the movie theater scene, Richard Kelly originally intended to have Donnie and Gretchen going to see Chud, the movie that came out in 1984. However, there were problems with finding out who owned the rights to the movie. Finally, Sam Raimi came to the rescue by allowing Kelly to use the distort free footage from The Evil Dead. Free of charge, this scene was filmed at the Arrow Theater on Montana Avenue in Santa Monica, California. What a stand-up guy. For real. I'm good with twer- uh, my trivia. Actually, I have, I have one more. On the set of Charlie Angels, Charlie's Angels, Drew Barrymore and Richard Kelly agreed that her production company, Flower Films, would produce the film for $4.5 million and that Barrymore would play Miss Pomeroy. Kelly says that if Barrymore hadn't stepped in, the movie would never have gone straight to the movie would have gone straight to video or cable television via stars. Stars. Stars kid. All right, yeah, that wraps our episode on Donnie Darko. Hopefully, we were able to explain this film um, coherently enough for you if you are still have been confused about it your entire life like a lot of people are um, I was yeah I hope you can digest it now and I think if you watch it again you'll get even more out of it because when you understand what's going on and you have more viewings of it it just gets better and better every time especially you know you can believe it's all in his head but it's just so much more fun when it's time travel and he has powers and it's, it's really cool yeah it's pretty wild this is it's like a crazy movie a, one of the best kinds of superheroes where it's it's not like a cape and uh, uniform. It's like I'm saving the universe with time travel and I don't even really know it. Yeah, it's, it's one of the best cult movies ever, I think. Take care, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Thanks so much for tuning in to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to subscribe if you're new. Hit the like button. Leave a comment. Find us on all audio streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find us. Find us on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to check out one of these other videos right here for more content on our favorite films and breaking down all kinds of movie content. Thanks so much.